Israel truth and falsehoods. I guess we're all aware that there are a lot of truths and falsehoods on this subject. I go around speaking on this subject and writing in various magazines and often you get all sorts of people telling you things which are, you know, completely untrue. And it's very hard sometimes to win the battle for uh, speaking on Israel. And we're very grateful that David's come to hopefully enlighten us and will enlighten us on some of these subjects which he's going to talk about. So I'm not going to take up a lot of his time. I'm going to hand over straight over to David to lead us and to speak to us on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you especially to Ginny and Barbara, with whom I've been discussing the planning of this evening's event. Um, it's nice every so often to experience a first in one's academic career. Now that I've retired, I feel I'm starting afresh, really. This is the first time I've an addre addressed an audience in a church hall, and it's the first time I've given four lectures on the one occasion. Um, what, ha what actually happened was uh, Barbara and Janie invited me to suggest topics for tonight's talk, so I, I offered them four, and they said, yes, please, we'll take all of them. <laughs> and um, that's, that hasn't happened to me in all these decades of lecturing. Um, so, I'm, so I'm deeply flattered, first of all, to have been invited here, and secondly, to have had all my suggestions accepted. And uh, as you'll hear, actually, although there are four topics, they're all highly interconnected with each other. Now, we all know that there's a tendency in modern discourse to portray Israel negatively. And um, what I find even more bizarre about this is not just the tendency to portray Israel negatively, but to portray falsehoods as truth and truth as falsehoods. That, that's actually going a step further than, than we normally think of as people's biases or preferences or political viewpoints. And that's something I, I really would like to explore with you this evening um, as we go along and particularly at the, the, uh, the discussion at the end of the session. Um, what I want to do is to show you using these four topics that we are really involved in a propaganda war. Israel is involved in a physical war in the Middle East and has been since 1948. In addition to that, Israel is facing a propaganda war around the world. And there are a number of battlefields to this propaganda war. There are multiple battlefields. I've just identified four that I think highlight the nature of the problem. Um, and as we go through them, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. But my purpose this evening is to draw your attention to the, some of the things that are being said about Israel at a very high level. No, I'm not talking about chit-chat in bars and dining tables. I'm, I'm talking about high political level and at a very high professional level, some of the things that are being said. And I want to offer you some, some of my personal thoughts about how these should be dealt with. A, how to rebut them and be how to put forward what I would regard as a more truthful analysis of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, at this point, I want to make a couple of declarations. First of all, I have dual UK-Israeli citizenship, and I've lived in Israel and worked in Israel for a number of years. But I have no political allegiance to any Israeli political party, and I'm not here to advocate or support or defend any particular policy of either the current or any previous Israeli government. So I want to make that very clear. The second declaration I want to make is that I come from an acad academic background, as you'll appreciate. So everything I say, I can back up with evidence. And you can challenge me on that if you doubt me, and, I, and feel free to do so because it's very good for me to be challenged. So if you hear me say something that you wonder about whether or not I'm being a bit strong there, challenge me, and I will try my very best to produce the evidence, because I believe, and, I, and I'll put my professional integrity on the line here, I believe that everything I say is evidence-based. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's go into the talks. After each of these mini lectures, if you like, I'm going to pause for about five minutes, and I'm going to ask the audience if anybody here has any burning questions or points of clarification or points of information that you would like to offer. But we'll try and keep that fairly brief so as not to interrupt the, the flow of the evening. And then when we get through to the end, by which time I hope you'll see some of the, the connections between these four themes, then I hope we'll be able to uh, have a more interactive uh, conversation about this subject and explore some of the implications for all of us, not just for Israel and for the Palestinians and for the Arab world, but for ourselves in this country, whether we're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or of no particular denomination at all. I've chosen these particular topics because I believe actually they represent a kind of hierarchy of argument that leads ultimately to that bottom line that you see there in that fourth topic. There's almost, there's a kind of unwritten subtext to all of this, um, which is not just the demonization of Israel in a very systematic way, but with a bottom line objective of getting rid of the, the, the state of Israel. I want to start with Palestinian health because this is something that I've had a uh, particular interest in and involvement, uh, involvement with um, for a number of years, going back to the 1980s when I worked at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Beersheba. Um, in those days, Israeli Arabs, of which the Bedouin Arabs were a, a large proportion in the southern part of Israel, didn't identify themselves specifically as Palestinian, but that's a trend that has developed over recent years. So the projects I worked in when I was there in the 1980s were to do with Bedouin health, but also to do with the health of the population of the residents of Gaza. And, and we made several field trips to Gaza and indeed to the West Bank as well. This was before the first Intifada, which broke out in 1987. And um, at that point, there was free access. People could come and go. They could come from those territories into Israel. And people from Israel could go into those territories. There were no checkpoints. There were no barriers. There was nothing. There was complete freedom of movement. And sadly, all that changed uh, after the second Intifada in the early 2000s. <coughs> so I'm going to be, when I say Palestinian health, uh, I'm going to be talking specifically about the residents of the West Bank and Gaza. I'm not talking about Israeli Arabs, and I'm not talking about the Palestinians living in neighboring Arab countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and so on. So I just want to make that clear. Jerusalem is sometimes, rather the eastern part of Jerusalem, is sometimes included in my data, sometimes not, depending on the data that I could get hold of. Now, this project all started because I, be, I, I was made aware, and a lot of colleagues were made aware, of an increasingly loud chorus of criticism directed from the medical press towards Israel. I don't know, is anybody here medical by any chance? Are there anybody in the medical profession? Okay, so I'll assume you don't know about this, but I, I, I know from talking to some of you informally that you may have, have heard about it. Um, I've quoted here from The Lancet, the first quotation here, and The Lancet comes to play a very central part in our story this evening. This is what Rita Giacomin and her co-author said. Now, Rita Giacomin is a colleague of mine, a public health professor from Birzeit University in Ramallah on the West Bank. Highly respected, is often in the UK giving talks, receiving honorary doctorates, publishing papers in prestigious journals like The Lancet and the British Medical Journal. There's what Rita Giacomin says, and I've highlighted her quote because I want to contrast it with a quote from some years later, just, just to show you, actually, there isn't a contrast. It's much the same thing. So this is what the critics say between 67 and 93. Health services for Palestinians in the occupied territory were neglected and starved of funds by Israel. That's a very strong accusation. Neglected and starved of funds. That implies a deliberate policy designed to do harm to the Palestinian healthcare system and to Palestinian health. So it's a strong accusation, and it's been published 
in one of the top three medical journals in the world. Okay, the top one is the New England Journal of Medicine. The Lancet comes second or third, depending on how these things are counted. So that, that's pretty strong, and I was aware that in 2009, the Lancet had established an organization or a network that they called the Lancet Palestinian Health Alliance, perfectly entitled to do that, um, which was going to be a platform for publications and lectures and meetings about Palestinian health also. I have no problem with that. But then when I read something in a, in a, in a journal that is supposed to be peer-reviewed, those of you who have an academic background will know that that's very important. A peer-reviewed a peer -reviewed journal means that before anything is published, it has to go through a number of hoops whereby senior colleagues vet everything, every, literally every word and every number that appears in that article is vetted and commented upon and criticized by colleagues. And only after it's been through that peer-reviewed process is the article published. And I thought, that's very odd that this kind of thing is being said and the peer reviewers are not commenting on it or asking it to be toned down or removed. Because it did strike me that this was simply untrue, what was being said here. And there's, an, there's another quote from The Spectator, not a medical journal, obviously, from Amy Shalan, who's one of the co-founders of Medical Aid for Palestinians that you may have heard of. And again, there it is, health services in the occupied territory were starved of funds. Very strong language. Shortages of staff, beds, medication, specialized services. Now, I was reading all of this stuff while I was, while I was doing my full-time academic work in Gla at Glasgow University. I didn't really have time to go into a detailed rebuttal of this. But once I retired a, a year or two ago, then I, I did have some time to work on it. And Alan Johnson, who's the editor of a journal called Fathom, some of you may know Fathom magazine. It's an offshoot of Bicom, a very good website worth looking at. He asked me to really address the Lancet's accusations in detail and provide a rebuttal if I felt that there was evidence to provide such a, a rebuttal. Just to give you a little bit of context, the editor, the editor of The Lancet for about the past 30 years is a man called Richard Horton, highly respected, except for one or two little aberrations in his career, like publishing of a paper uh, some years ago that you may remember, uh, allegedly linking the MMR vaccine with childhood autism. And for many years, Horton refused to retract, retract that article, but it has since been fully retracted. So that, that was a bit of a blemish on his reputation. But other than that, he's, he's highly respected. Here he is uh, talking uh, to, about medical aid for Palestinians at something that he, at a meeting that was held under the auspices of the Lancet uh, Palestinian Health Alliance. What did Horton do? Not only has he published articles that thrust accusations at Israel, but he has actually magnified those allegations and thrown his own tuppence worth in through editorials and other means. So this was from an editorial about the occupied Palestinian territory. And here we have the same accusation that the people of the Palestinian territory matter because they're, they're continuing to experience, this is 2009, four years after Israel's complete pullout from Gaza, they're continuing to experience an occupation that has produced chronic de-development. That's not just that they have stagnated, but the opposite, they've been de-developed for, for many decades. So again, the implication that this is a deliberate policy, and if you, if you hear some of the things that uh, Horton has said in public, it's very clear he means that it's a deliberate policy. So, what did I try to do? I tried to answer this question, it's a very simple question. Has Israel damaged Palestinian health? Now, some people, when they see that, burst out laughing. They, they can't think of anything more absurd. Well, obviously, Israel has damaged Palestinian health in so many ways, whether it's responding to rocket, rocket attacks in Gaza through various conflicts, through the erection of the security barrier, through the stop and search and equivalent policies in Israel. Of course, they've damaged Palestinian health. And I have to say, 
my approach to this was that I probably would be in for rather an unpleasant shock as to the degree of damage that Israel has probably perpetrated, maybe perhaps no, through no fault of her own, but if you occupy the territory of people who are hostile to you, there are going to be a lot of negative consequences. And my objectives were divided into these two parts, and I really want to concentrate on the second of those, but I'll, I'll cover the first one as well in passing. So that was my question. What was the impact of Israeli policies and practices on Palestinian health? Now, in epidemiology, epidemiology is the basic science of public health. What we try and do is we build up a, what we call a community diagnosis, a picture, a profile of the population. And we always start with demography, the basic um, statistical information about populations. So there you can see, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the point is that between 1967 and around 2010, the Palestinian population more than trebled more than trebled. Now bear in mind, this is during a time when Israel's detractors are telling her that she's practicing ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. So this so-called ethnic cleansing has resulted in a trebling of the Palestinian population, which incidentally is a bigger increase than happened to the Israeli population. But broadly speaking, Israel's population also trebled. And both of these, I think this is one of the interesting findings, both of these phenomena can be attributed to these three factors, a high birth rate, improving life expectancy, and net inward migration, something that's not appreciated, that much of the Palestinian population has been boosted by net inward migration from countries where Palestinian, Palestinians work. For example, in the Gulf, there are many Palestinians, and many of them actually were kicked out um, after the first Gulf War, um, by the Kuwaitis at the end because they, they took the wrong side against Saddam Hussein and the, many of them came to the West Bank and Gaza. Now, uh, an index that we pay a lot of attention to in, in public health is infant mortality. Without going into details about this, if you have to pick one index of health of a population, choose infant mortality because it seems to be particularly sensitive to the general conditions prevailing in a society, the level of health care, the efficiency and effectiveness of government interventions. And that's why we choose infant mortality. In Western countries, it's not so helpful because it's so low. But in developing countries, we still use infant mortality. Now, this graph shows infant mortality over, roughly speaking, a 30-year period in the West Bank and Gaza. And it's very obvious what's happened. It's fallen. There's a little bit of a plateau in the middle, as you can see there, around about, 90, around about the mid-1990s, actually, there's a bit of a plateau. I don't have an explanation for that. The only observation I will make is that in the mid-1990s, responsibility for health, public health, was transferred from Israel to the Palestinian Authority. And it's thought that some of the programs that Israel started were discontinued, Others were continued. Um, but that's what happened. And if you look at the proportional uh, decreases in infant mortality between the 1950s and 1980s, if you look at that far right-hand column, you'll see very substantial decreases both in Israel and in the West Bank and Gaza and in many of the surrounding countries. It was a regional effect, actually, probably of economic development. Um, Israel started with a relatively low rate in the 1950s, but managed to continue the progress in bringing down infant mortality. Palestine started with, well, I've called it Palestine, West Bank and Gaza, um, started with a very high rate, mainly due to the neglect of health and health care by the um, Egyptians in Gaza and the Jordanians in the West Bank, respectively. And again, you can see there, as a result of of a variety of factors, there was a decrease in infant mortality right up to the 1990s. Immunization coverage is another very good indicator of public health because immunization is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal to improve the health of children in a population. And what we try to do with these vaccines that you see listed there, we try to get as close to 100% as we can. We can't get there. In this country, it's in the, in the low 90s. 
occasionally in, drops into the 80s, such as after that MMR paper. Um, but you can see here that the, the, the formatting has got a, gone a bit ski with, by the way, but the left-hand column are the Palestinian territories and the right-hand column is, is Israel. And what you can actually see is that in a number of cases, the West Bank and Gaza did better in terms of their immunization rates than Israel did. And the rates are very comparable with other regional rates. If we look at education, our education is absolutely crucial to the health of a population, particularly female education. And from a very low starting point in 1970, remember Israel had been in, uh, in control of these territories since 1967. In 1970, nearly half the population had no education at all. And over time, that proportion dropped. And if you look at the bottom line there, the proportion receiving 13 years or more of education increased more than tenfold. So you see, you see the point, you see what's happening here. There's a pattern developing here of major improvements in health and what I've called the public health infrastructure. Water is a highly politicized issue. You've probably he heard about Israel stealing water from the Palestinians. On the contrary, between the 1970s and the 1990s, a period before the Palestinian Authority took control, the proportion of homes with, with running water and electricity increased very strikingly. There are the figures there. They come from Isra an Israeli bureau, but nobody has challenged them. The Palestinian Authority hasn't challenged them. And the increase in Gaza has been actually greater than in the West Bank. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide just to make the point that fairly sophisticated health care was introduced into the West Bank and Gaza for the very first time in the 60s, 70s and 80s in all of these areas. And a very important point is that last bullet point because it draws attention to the fact that Israel established training programs for healthcare professionals in conjunction with the five new universities that Israel had established. So, my conclusions. The central allegation was, you will remember, that Israel systematically damaged Palestinian health and healthcare. Well, it's not only untrue, it's the opposite of the truth. Israel substantially improved Palestinian health from 1967. And that happened in the face of terrorism, war, and hostility coming from those territories throughout that period. And yet, despite the evidence I've presented to you, that I don't believe anybody can challenge, the data come from a variety of sources, including international source, sources such as the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the Palestinian health service, as well as the Israeli uh, sources. Despite that, Israel's critics, and I've put that in inverted commas because I want to come back to this issue of who these critics are, continue to blame Israel for what, what happened and what is happening today. They call it the legacy of occupation. Whereas, in fact, the legacy of occupation is rather positive. Okay, that's just an acknowledgement. You can read a more detailed account of that report in Fathom Journal. It was published in, uh, about a year ago and it's still, still online. So I'm going to pause there and ask if anybody's got any, any burning questions or points of information before we move on to the next topic. Yes, well... I'm, I'm going to explain in, in the next section what we did in relation to what the Lancet got up to after last year's war between Israel and Hamas and the Gaza casualties. And we, we wrote a very detailed rebuttal, which they didn't publish. But, um, I'll exp but at that point, we did, at this point, in, in relation to 2009, all, of, all those of us who knew something about Israel and who cared about Israel could do was just observe with mounting dismay what was happening. Because it's actually very time consuming to mount an evidence-based rebuttal of this, this kind. I thought it would take me a few weeks, it took 
seven, eight, nine months to complete that report. Any other questions or comments? Sure. Well, much of his funding comes from us. Yeah. Much of the funding comes from EU taxpayers. The EU is the biggest single donor to the Palestinian Authority. In addition to that, private individuals give donations to organizations that perhaps many people here support, and, you know, NGOs like Oxfam, Save the Children, who also provide health care facilities and other facilities on the West Bank and Gaza. And then the, the United Nations, which again we indirectly pay, pay for, through an organization called UNRWA, the United Nations Work and, Works and Relief Association, they provide a lot of services specifically for the refugee populations, that's refugees and their descendants, which we may have time to talk about if, if the opportunity arises later. So it's complicated, and then of course Israel provides some funding. Israel continues to provide funding, um, but at a lower level, obviously, than she did. She provided the bulk of the funding when she was in direct control of these territories. But since the Oslo Accords, which created the Palestinian Authority, um, much of that funding ceased, and funding is raised from local pal Palestinian taxes by the Palestinian Authority and, and put into their infrastructure. Um, do you mean the, the, the critical article or my article? Your article, the article there about um, Jackson. There were, there were a couple of letters published, not very little, relatively little. But c colleagues of mine from Israel did respond and did attempt a more detailed rebuttal. But, and I saw, I saw some of the drafts of, that they had submitted, but they were told, no, this is too long, too long. And eventually, relatively short, one or two short letters were published. That was all. <laughs> 